All right. Welcome everybody. I'm going to I'm going to get us started here because we have a fabulous fabulous uh, speaker for our grand rounds today and I don't want to make sure we cut into his time too much. Welcome everybody. Uh, my great pleasure to welcome our grand round speaker today, uh, Dr. Michael Kitlin. Uh, Mike is a professor at uh, UCLA. He's in charge of all of adult uh, clinical services they do, uh, which is a very, very large, complex, uh, and a super high quality uh, healthcare delivery system. Uh, he, uh, uh, he and I uh, um, had a nice dinner last night where we shared some nice memories about uh, what goes on <laughs> down there uh, at our West Coast competitors. Uh, and he reminded me that he has a new boss, and that's Jonice Fiesel. Uh, Jonice moved from Harborview down to uh, UCLA. Uh, so there is some nice sharing that way. Uh, Mike is, uh, has been for how long have you done mood disorders clinic? 39 UCLA? years. 39 years. He's run a, a clinic at UCLA that is probably one of the best uh, clinic treating people with bipolar disorder and other serious mood disorders uh, uh, around. Has a tremendous amount of clinical experience. He's a fabulous writer, author. Uh, Ryan Kimmel said to him at dinner last night that uh, when he talks to the resident about psychopharm uh, for bipolar disorder, he says, and if you want to stay up to date just twice a year, I'll look up uh, Gitlin uh, and see what he's written uh, recently. Um, so uh, won't say a lot more, uh, just a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you. That was very kind. I'm very happy to be up here. The last time I gave grand rounds up here was about six years ago, so it's nice to be back. Um, yes, my topic is going to be bipolar depression, which is one of the, certainly the most interesting topics that we have in the mood world. And I'm gonna focus probably about 50 to 60% of the talk on what do we know about antidepressants and bipolar depression, because that's the most interesting and the most controversial. So let's... Okay, it worked 15 minutes ago. Ah, now it works. Okay, so let's remember that even though according to the DSM, the defining pole of bipolar disorder is mania, obviously that's what all of the DSM in mood disorders is based on the bifurcation of unipolar and bipolar disorder based on the presence of mania or hypomania, at the same time, Depression is the dominant pole of bipolar disorder. If you look at all of the studies and the six that, are, that exist are on this slide, you can see that basically if you add them up, the average bipolar person spends three times as much time depressed with or without treatment in their life as they do manic or hypomanic. And in fact, there's some data that if you look at BP2, bipolar twos, the ratio is far higher. There's one study the Lou Judd study, uh, the NIMH collaborative study, that showed a 34 to 1 ratio, meaning the average bipolar 2 patient in 12-year follow-up spent four days hypomanic and 185 days depressed. That was in that particular study. But 3 to 1 is a good ballpark average. There are lots of papers you'll see where people distinguish, you know, what are the symptoms associated with unipolar versus bipolar depression. Yes, there are differences the similarities outweigh the differences. Bipolar depressed people have more of what are the so-called atypical features, uh, hypersomnia, psychomotor retardation versus agitation and insomnia. They're much more likely to be psychotic, right? Depression with psychotic features than are unipolars, but there's no real pathognomonic feature that will say, ah, this is bipolar depression versus unipolar depression. So again, there are just some soft differences that may help a little bit, but they're not that big a deal. When you have, when you're thinking about treating a regular unipolar depressed patient, all you're looking for is, will what you prescribe work, right? That's, that's what you're thinking about. You're not really worried that antidepressants are going to make unipolar depression worse. However, in bipolar depression, obviously there are some more subtle considerations. So the only difference here in terms, of op, uh, in terms of options, obviously mood stabilizers, and I'll summarize re relatively quick, quickly what we know about that, mood stabilizers are much more of an option for uh, bipolar depression, but antidepressants and ECT are the same options available for unipolars. 
But the key is this. So again, you efficacy is a key question for unipolars and bipolars, but bullets two and three are not things you worry about when you prescribe an SSRI or an SNRI or bupropion for unipolar depression. So what do you worry about for bipolars? This is obviously about antidepressants. One is the rate of pharmacological switching. What is the likelihood that if you give a bipolar an antidepressant, they're not going to become euthymic, but overshoot the mark into hypomania and mania. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time showing you the data we have on that. And the other one is the idea that even though you may not flip someone into mania, what you may do is cause a period of mood instability. Terry Ketter at Stanford called it the roughening of the course. Say that three times, the roughening of the course. And it's just if you did daily mood ratings, what you'd see is just more affective instability. And you can see that separate from pharmacological switching into hypomania or mania. All right, so now let me summarize what we know about this, this topic, not with the antidepressants, and then we'll go to the antidepressants. So first, what do we know about acute antidepressant effects of mood stabilizers? And the answer is we know much less than you think, you, you think we know. For lithium, it is surprising how little data there are. If you look at the older studies, they were all done in the 60s and 70s, a little bit in the 80s, when we didn't have classic random assignment, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies, therefore using modern, modern uh, ways of analyzing data, you would say the data are really pretty soft. Obviously, lithium doesn't cause switching, so you don't have to worry about that. Carbamazepine, otegretol, weak, very little data. Nobody really uses it much. This is for acute bipolar depression. We're not talking prevention of. For Valparate, it's very interesting. There are four double-blind studies, both all four are relatively small n, and they're positive. So why don't you prescribe more Valparate or Depakote for bipolar depression? Because at the time those four studies came out, Depakote was about to lose its patent, and Abbott walked away, and nobody's done another study. I think I have the, no, I don't have the pretty slide. So Depakote is indeed an option, even though it's rarely used because we don't have any large end studies. We just have these four studies. If you want to look it up, that Bond study, 2010, that's the meta-analysis and review it if you're interested. For Lamotrigine, for Lamotrigine, we have a bigger issue. We have five double-blind studies, and almost assuredly, all of you have seen one of them. The first one, the Joe Calabrese study of the late 90s, that was the first double-blind study of lamotrigine for acute bipolar depression, showed it was positive, everyone is excited. So why does lamotrigine not have an FDA indication for acute bipolar depression? Because then your friends at Glaxo did four more double-blind placebo-controlled con studies, every one of which was negative. So what does a good drug company do with four negative studies? Right, they didn't publish them. So then one day somebody beat it out of them and there's a summary paper but they didn't get published as individual studies, which is why nobody seems to know that they exist. Nonetheless, what you can then do is add them up, which is not kosher to do, in a pooled, not a meta-analysis, a pooled analysis. Just add the data from all five studies, imagining you have one large N study, and then you analyze it. These two people, John Geddes and Joe Calabrese, published two separate papers. So the total N of these five studies is just over 1,000 patients. And if you look at bullet two, you can see that the efficacy is weak at best. I mean, a, you know, a number to treat of 11 is clinically close to invisible. Anything that's over 10, a clinician would not be able to perceive a difference. And you see a response rate of 47 to 38 is really nothing to write home about. However, Geddes took the data set and then said, well, how about if we divide up the data into the more severely depressed patients, HAMDs of 24 or above, versus milder depressed people, HAMD of 23 or below. And lo and behold, when you do that, you see reasonably good efficacy for the more depressed people. So for the people whose HAMDs are more than 24, you have a number to treat of seven. That's clinically relevant. That'll play. And for the mildly depressed people, you don't see a difference. So what you can say at this point is that lamotrigine is probably effective and more likely to be effective in the group of bipolar depressed people who are more severely depressed. Gabapentin, there's no really good evidence that it's eff effective for depression. 
we use it in the bipolar world for anxiety a fair amount and levetiracetam, Keppra, same. There's nothing there. Another acute Lamotrigine study is this one. You take people published, which is about a year and a half ago, take people who are on quetiapine, which has its own, of course, bipolar antidepressant efficacy, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then you add either lamotrigine or placebo, and you see that lamotrigine augments quetiapine's efficacy, meaning it has its own unique additive antidepressant effects. That's a good thing. All right, so now let's talk about mood stabilizers and their ability to prevent, not treat, but prevent depression. By the way, there are a bunch of open seats for those of you standing in the back. If you like to stand, enjoy yourself. So lithium, of course, is our, our old, oldest friend in this world. What do we know about lithium as a maintenance treatment? Here too, after 50 years, less than you think. If you look at modern ways of analyzing data, meaning you gotta have a placebo, random assignment, all that, there are only seven controlled studies in the multiple decades that we've been using it. And lithium is, if you look at the bottom, the bottom bullet, you see if you just look at prevention of depression, there's only a trend for lithium to be better than placebo at preventing depressive episodes. Most of lithium's efficacy preventively is driven by its mania prevention, not its depression prevention. So it has some data, but less than you would imagine. And if you're gonna do this, this is an analysis of one of the studies, the best recent study. And what this does is trichotomize the data, well, dichotomize the data. So the, um, the red is placebo. This is a maintenance treatment trial, prevention of a mood episodes. The red is placebo. The dark blue is lithium levels under 0.6, and the light blue on this slide is lithium levels at 0.6 or above. So what does that show? If you're gonna use lithium as a preventive agent, get the level to 0.6 or above. Under 0.6, no different than placebo. This is the largest N well-designed study we've had in the last 15 years. So unless we have more data, this is as good as we're gonna get. How about valprate as a preventive treatment? Well, unfortunately, valprate, which I still use pretty regularly as a maintenance treatment in bipolar disorder, and we use for acute mania at times, does not have an FDA indication as a maintenance treatment because this double-blind study published now 18 years ago failed to show separation, valparate from placebo. Now, technically, it's a failed trial, not a negative trial, because lithium, which was an active comparator, also didn't separate from placebo. But we know that lithium prevents mood episodes. I mean, most studies show that. So when your active comparator doesn't separate from placebo, it's thought of as a failed trial, meaning there was something funky in the way the trial was done. And that's probably true. This study required greater clinical stability than any maintenance study since then. And therefore, because you had a more stable group of patients, those treated with placebo did much better than you'd expect, thereby making it harder to show drug placebo difference. In terms of lamotrigine, we know that lamotrigine does have the FDA indication, as it should, as a preventive treatment for bipolar disorder, driven much more by its prevention of depression than mania. This is the, the, there were two studies, if you add them together, you get these data, the bright orange line is lamotrigine, the blue line is lithium, the tan line is placebo, and what you can see is the lamotrigine clearly is more effective somewhat than lithium, statistically significantly more effective than placebo in preventing depression. So lamotrigine is a major player in maintenance treatment with depression predominant bipolars, and that's why it's the kind of the, the darling of the bipolar two world, where you're much more worried about depression than you are about hypomania. Bipolar one obviously is a little different, but for bipolar twos, lamotrigine suggests itself highly in this way. All right, so now let me start by talking about antidepressants acutely, and then I'll go to the switch data a little later. <clears throat> so, Edu Eduardo Vieda is one of the giants in the bipolar world. Uh, he's in Barcelona, and he wrote this editorial 10 years ago, which I thought got it exactly right, and 10 years later, it's still exactly right. He says, we are still uncertain whether antidepressants are effective, ineffective, 
safe or unsafe and bipolar depression. And they might end up being the four things at the same time, depending on their class, particular pharmacodynamics, and concomitant therapy. My first thought when I read it is, what office is he running for? How can you say nothing and something simultaneously in a way that you could never imagine quoting it again? But in fact, Vieta got it right. He's exactly right. We obsess over, do antidepressants work? Do they cause switching? That's probably the wrong question. Probably the right question is, for which subgroup of bipolars are antidepressants effective? And for which subgroup of bipolars might they pose considerable risk? That's probably the better way to think of it, think of it as opposed to this dichotomous good-bad stuff, which is the way we tend to think. So I'm going to show you only relatively recent data because the older data, A, is not as good, B, the ends are too small, and they're older. So the first of the great modern studies looking at antidepressants for bipolar depression was the Stanley Foundation data. UCLA was one of the sites. It was five sites. These are bipolar ones and twos. Everybody is on any mood stabilizer that the doctor wanted, lithium, valproate, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, et cetera. Uh, at the time, it was the largest end study of its sort, uh, 184 people. It was double blind, but there was no placebo. So that's an important design issue. And the three antidepressants were very reasonably picked, bupropion, Welbutrin, sertraline, Zoloft, and venlafaxine, Effexor, at reasonable adequate dose for all three. And what you see, if you look at the bottom part, the IDS is the inventory for depressive symptoms, 50% improvement was the definition of response. And as you can see, there's no significant difference across the three groups, and the efficacy was nothing to write home about for any of them. Efficacy of 30, 33 to 41% ain't going to get you in the Hall of Fame. So equal, but not a big deal. The next important study was the STEP BD study that Gary Sachs was the head of, that was 179 bipolar one and two depressed people. Oh, there's a mistake. The paroxetine dose was not 300 milligrams a day. Please let me reassure you, it's 30 milligrams a day. <laughs> hey, what's a zero between friends? Anyway, 300 milligrams of Welbutrin, 30 of, of Paxil versus placebo. And there is absolutely no difference in sustained recovery rates or response rates, like not even close to close. This, to make sure that no psychiatrist read it, they published in the New England Journal, just to ensure that this made as little impact on us as it could. Anyway, this was a negative study. There were no switches. There, were no, there was no efficacy. It was like you were giving antidepressants water. It did nothing. Either way, it didn't hurt people, didn't help people. Even though this was published in the New England Journal, which was surprising, because there are a lot of methodological problems in this study. Everyone had to be on mood stabilizers, but in fact, they could have been on mood stabilizers for only three days before they went into the study. Should have been on constant doses of mood stabilizers for X period of time, four weeks, six weeks, whatever. So there's a lot of reason to think that this study may not be the revealed truth, as it were. All right, so then if you take all the studies, again, there are only about six that you can actually put into a meta-analysis, you take these studies, which include the Gary Sachs study, and put them into a meta-analysis. This was done by Cedor and McQueen from Canada. What you find is that this is the efficacy data for response, right? 50% improvement as what you can see, test for overall effect, p-value of 0.28. Not significantly different. So this meta-analysis then gets quoted all the time as saying, see, antidepressants don't work for bipolar depression. Okay, and then if you do the same thing for clinical remission, you find the p-value doesn't favor it here either. So you say antidepressants simply don't work. It's a simplistic answer, but that would be the way to interpret this meta-analysis. However, there are other ways of doing um, meta-analyses and other ways of defining which study, studies go into this. This is a separate study published a year actually before the one I just showed you, where they looked at the, in studies where they gave antidepressants to unipolars and bipolars, was there a difference in efficacy between the two groups of patients? And in this meta-analysis, the answer is there was no difference, implying that in head-to-head -head trials, that, there were, that antidepressants were just as effective 
for bipolar depression as they are for unipolar depression. Um, and again, if you look at then a year later, a separate meta-analysis with a slightly different set of inclusion and exclusion criteria, you may remember the Cedar and McQueen was six papers. This is more like nine. And suddenly in this meta-analysis, it looks like antidepressants work. So there are, you can have multiple meta-analyses that give you different results because of subtle differences in inclusion and exclusion criteria. The moral of that story is don't ever take any single study or paper, even a meta-analysis, as the revealed truth. There's too much variability across studies and across statistical analyses to take any answer as this is the gospel. And again, this shows you the same thing where there's evidence that antidepressants work just as well for bipolars as, and, as unipolars. So if I've confused you as to the, answering the question of do antidepressants work for bipolar depression, I will have succeeded so far. Excellent. We're going to get back to switch data in a little bit. Let me talk first about antipsychotics because that's a big deal. For those of us who are a little older, who grew up in the first generation antipsychotic era, Haldol, Prolexin, Thorazine, Stelazine, Navin, my old friends. Um, the idea of using D2 blockers to treat depression is absolutely a nutty concept because those medicines typically made people depressed because they all were powerful D2 blockers, which means people got either subtle or not so subtle akinesia, which makes people feel depressed. If you look at schizophrenia studies, higher doses of D2 blockers, give you higher rates of depressive symptomatology, almost assuredly because it's akinesia, it's a side effect. So the idea of antipsychotics having antidepressant efficacy was a, a truly a stunning and novel concept when it came out, but lo and behold. So again, rather than showing you the individual studies, as you probably know, two, anti, two antipsychotics have FDA indications for acute bipolar depression, they're quetiapine and lorazidone, Seroquel and Latuda. This is, again, this now is now six years old, so it doesn't have the Latuda data, which I'll show you separately in a minute. This shows you the data from a whole bunch. There's the quetiapine, three and 600 milligrams, one olanzapine study, a few aripiprazole studies. Clearly, a number of antipsychotics have true antidepressant efficacy, either when given as monotherapy or added to lithium or valproate. They're the two different designs. They show essentially the same results. By the way, since quetiapine has absolutely the most data, uh, you see four, five studies there, and there's actually one or two since then. If you're going to use quetiapine for acute bipolar depression and every study finds efficacy, they, they were all done with forced dose titration to either three or 600 milligrams, and in every study, there was no difference in efficacy between the two doses. So the moral of that story is, you don't probably need to go above 300 milligrams for the antidepressant effect of quetiapine. Not only that, because these were not varied variable dose studies, but fixed dose studies, none of us actually know whether 200 milligrams might be enough in some patients. My guess is it would be, but there are no data relevant because everybody in these studies went to 300 or 600 and it was a rigid dosing structure. So you can't answer the question about any other, any other doses. And then since then, since this study I just showed you came out, um, there have been two antipsychotics that have shown good data. One got the FDA indication, and that was lorazidone or Latuda. Um, this was the first study, and what they did is they divided it up into the placebo, which is the gray line, and the blue and the red line are 20 to 60 milligrams and 80 to 120 that don't differ at all. So again, 20 to 60 is as effective as 80 to 120, very parallel to the quetiapine 300-600. So it looks increasingly like when you use the second generation antipsychotics for antidepressant efficacy, it's significantly lower dosing structure than you use for either schizophrenia or acute mania, or even frankly maintenance treatment of bipolar disorder. It's the low dose of the second generation agents that seem to confer, confer antidepressant efficacy. Think about the adjunctive antipsychotic, antidepressant effect of aripiprazole, right? It's two to 10 milligrams, it's not 15 to 20. 
And in fact, when aripiprazole was tested for bipolar depression, I didn't bring the slides, it was a negative study and it didn't get the indication, the people on higher doses of Abilify had a lower antidepressant effect than the people on the lower doses. So there are good reasons to stay with the lower sub-antipsychotic doses if you're gonna use antipsychotics to treat depression, not psychosis, but depression. And then in the second study, Latuda was tested uh, as an adjunct to lithium or valproid. In these studies, everybody goes on lithium or valproid, doctor's choice, and then you double blind, add lorazodone or placebo. So you're testing the additive efficacy of the drug, in this case, Latuda, and as you can see, it worked. So Latuda has the FDA indication. We use it pr pretty regularly in the mood disorders clinic. And most recently is a study on Vralar, cariprazine, showing basically the same kind of efficacy, that at relatively low doses, it's hard to see. Here, here's your dosing structure. But at low doses, one, two milligrams. Ah, thank you. Right. Uh, using one to two milligrams, you see pretty good efficacy for Vralar as an antidepressant. So again, put it all together, and you see that as a class effect, the second generation antipsychotics seem to have antidepressant efficacy at low doses, sub antipsychotic doses. And just because I couldn't figure out where else to put it in my talk, I decided to say something about my friend the vigils, modafinil and R modafinil, um, pro vigil and new vigil, both of which are generic, but new vigil is still stunningly expensive. Um, modafinil is not, I'll get to that in a minute. Both of them, which remember, these are stimulants that don't work through dopamine. They pr presumably work through orexin, which is a, uh, a stimulating or arousal alertness neurotransmitter in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And if you look at the studies, and there are now six of them, three on modafinil, three on r modafinil for bipolar depression, what you can say is neither got an FDA indication because only one of three was positive for each of them. I actually use it all the time adjunctively. I have to tell you, FDA indication or not, I think modafinil and r modafinil are very helpful at just helping the psychomotor retarded, lethargic, hypersomnic, depressed people just to help them get out of bed in the morning. So I use it with some regularity. Um, and if you look, by the way, at these six studies, the switch rate comparing modafinil or r modafinil to placebo in all six studies, no difference in any one of them. So you can prescribe modafinil or r modafinil to your bipolar depressed patients with, as they say in the SAT world, cheerful alacrity. You don't have to worry that it's going to cause a switch because it doesn't. Six studies all show no difference in switch rate between drug and placebo. So that's like a good thing. So my comment about money was, do you have Costco in Seattle? Oh, thank God. Costco says gener sells generic modafinil, not r modafinil, for 80 cents a pill, $27 or so, that's 90 cents a pill, $27 for 30 pills for 200, milli 200 milligram modafinil. Such a deal, it's cheaper than Starbucks. So think of it that way. This is without insurance. That's a big deal. CVS charges $5, by the way. All right, so now let's get to the part that I think is the most controversial, which is what do we know about switch data for bipolar depression and the use of antidepressants thereof. And there are, as with so many things in our field, people are seriously passionate. Remember that line is why are the fights in academia so intense? Because the stakes are so small, right? It's the same thing here. People fight about this. The database is trivial. And yet everybody comes down on different sides of this almost religious dispute. So on the left side, we have Fred Goodwin and Nasir Gami, who write paper after paper saying that all antidepressants cause, cause switches at high rates. We're going to go over that in a minute. Antidepressants do not prevent suicide, and mood stabilizers work so well. Why would you ever have to use an antidepressant? So they're very much against antidepressants and bipolar depression. And on the right side, two German psychiatrists, Müller and Grunzi, they say, well, wait a minute, that's not true. The switch rates with the second generation agents, SSRIs, bupropion, are less than with the tricyclics. 
And antidepressants effectively treat depression and therefore would prevent suicide, although the data are very hard to show. And antidepressants have their own independent efficacy. So that's the argument on both sides. And again, there is great passion, much heat, little light. So now let's talk about the modern studies and the switch data that exist. The first of the important studies in the modern era was our friend Vieta, who published his wonderful political comment. Uh, it was a small N study, and we didn't take it too seriously because the N was so small, but as, as always, Dr. Vieta got it right. 60 bipolar ones and twos in their bipolar clinic in Barcelona uh, who were given paroxetine mean dose 32 milligrams, venlafaxine 179 milligrams, equal response, and the rates of switch you can see at the bottom is for Fexor it was 13% and paroxetine Paxil is 3%. Now 13 versus three is a real difference, except if you look at the ends, that's like three patients versus one patient. Well, when you're down to single digits, you should be very careful over-interpreting it. So I thought this was a hint, nothing more. Second one was the study I showed you the efficacy data of from before, which was the Stanley study. This was the double-blind, non-placebo-controlled study of Effexor and Zoloft and Welbutrin. For everybody's on bipolar ones and twos, three quarters of people with BP1s, and everybody's on a mood stabilizer. And if you look at the switch rate, um, what you can see across here is that the switch rate for Welbutrin and Zoloft are basically the same, five to seven percent are not statistically significantly different. And Effexor has double the switch rate, 15 percent. So go back to Vieta's study. So now we have two studies showing that an SNRI, venlafaxine, has twice the switch rate of either an SSRI, in this case Zoloft, or bupropion, Welbutrin. That's the world's data on SS, SNRIs, guys. Don't you want to know what the Cymbalta data is? Sure, so do I. doesn't exist. We know absolutely nothing about Cymbalta for bipolar depression. We know nothing about mirtazapine. We know nothing about the other new ones. So for right now, all we... Did you want to ask something? But there's case validity to expect that Cymbalta would be a little more dangerous and Cymbalta would be a little more dangerous still because it's more norepinephrine, right? Right if that really is the key, right. if that's the question. But this, I mean, this is really the world's data on what we know about SNRIs versus SSRIs. Two venlafaxine studies showing twice the uh, switch rate. Oh, and by the way, the other thing, look at the switch rate in BP1s versus BP2s. I'll show you a summary slide at the end about this, but the, the final truth is BP, no matter what you do, BP1 switch at a far higher rate, rate than BP2s did. That's just plain true. And I'll show you some compelling data. So you want to know, I would want to know, what happens if you give an SSRI, low switch rate, to a bipolar 1 depressed patient in the absence of a mood stabilizer? When uh, Symbiax came out, that was the fluoxetine olanzapine combination pill that Lily developed they would not use a fluoxetine monotherapy arm because they thought it was unethical. Glaxo didn't seem to feel that way, so they did a monotherapy paroxetine study. I guess ethics change when you go from, I don't know, Indianapolis to London. Anyway, they used paroxetine as an com active comparator to, in one of their uh, Seroquel studies, and the, the Paxil arm is this one, okay? And look at the switch rates at the bottom. This is the efficacy data. The switch rate, these are bipolar ones on monotherapy Paxil. Now, you know, everyone says, oh my God, they're going to, they're all going to switch. Well, it turns out they're not all going to switch. And I forgot it was like an eight week study. What you can see is the switch rate of paroxetine and placebo were identical, 11 versus 9%. Now the quetiapine people switched at a lower rate because quetiapine, right, prevents manias. But there was, in fact, no difference between Paxil and placebo. These are BP1s in this, uh, the, what I'm showing you here. Stunning. So the answer is that, yes, do SSRIs cause switching? Of course. But the data showing that they show overwhelming numbers of switches ain't there, at least in the short run. Okay. And if you look, there are other ways. There are these huge observational studies, mostly from Europe, where they have these amazingly centralized databases. This is one from Scandinavia, 
where they took over 3,000 bipolar ones and examined looking with what's called within subject design times they're on antidepressants and time they're not. And what they show, I think I have a pretty picture. No, it's, it's later. The, what it showed is that bipolar ones treated with antidepressants alone had higher switch rates. That's a 2.83, but it was relatively not a very high switch rate. And once you get past the first numbers of months, that switch rate goes back down to the number of people who take placebo or don't take antidepressants. So do antidepressants cause switching? Yes. Do they do it universally, which is you just close your eyes and don't pay attention to the words, just to the music. You imagine in our field, you give a bipolar one an antidepressant, they're all going to switch. Well, that's just not true. There are no data showing that's true. They switch, but most of them don't, at least in the short run. Again, if we look at the affective switch data, this is the Cedar and McQueen paper that I showed you before. There is absolutely no evidence in the six double-blind studies for which meta-analytic techniques were appropriate. There's no difference in switch rates. Most of these people were on mood stabilizers. Short-term study, no difference between antidepressants and placebo. P-value is 0.89, if you can see it down here. There it is, okay? And again, if you do this number to treat, number to harm, you end up with the same, the same evidence, which is when you add an antidepressant to a mood stabilizer, switch rates in the short run are amazingly low. All right, so now let me show you the most recent meta-analysis published, whatever, 16, 17 months, 16 months ago. Um, and again, each meta-analysis has a slightly different set of inclusion and exclusion criteria. For this one, it was about 1,400 patients, mostly BP1s, short-term studies, meaning six weeks to 26 weeks at the most. And in, the, in this particular analysis, it was SSRIs, agomelatine, which is a melatonin agonist antidepressant available in Europe, not here, will never come out here, and bupropion. And as with the earlier, most of the earlier meta-analyses, there was no evidence of efficacy, but they did something very interesting. They then took the data and divided them up by which studies use which kinds of mood stabilizers. And stunningly, when you just look at the data, when the mood stabilizer was an antipsychotic, olanzapine, risperidone, quetiapine, aripiprazole, those guys, you find that antidepressants work. Now, does that mean that antidepressants plus antipsychotics, which may have their own antidepressant efficacy, that that's a unique combination? With classic mood stabilizers, lithium valproate, it didn't seem to work. Now, nobody else has done this kind of sub-analysis showing that maybe antidepressants augmenting antipsychotics are a better antidepressant treatment than antidepressants added to lithium or valproate. Again, you can't know, it's just one meta-analysis, but I thought that was a pretty intriguing and unexpected finding. And when they looked at switch rate, this is bullet two, you see no evidence of a differential switch rate between drug versus placebo, except if you look at the two studies, which had a one-year naturalistic extension, a 52-week extension, there was a very, very slightly higher switch rate over one year, patients on antidepressants. So the p-value is 0.04, which is obviously significant, but the number to harm of 19 is awfully weak. So again, just a bit of subtle evidence. All right, I've, I've already shown you what this shows and I wanna get on to something else. All right, so I have two other, yes. You know what, can you hold to the Q&A? So there are two other areas I wanna cover and then I wanna leave time for questions. So first is about bipolar two. Most of what I've just shown you is bipolar one data, right? And uh, that makes sense because that's the bigger disorder and all that stuff. But there are an awful lot of bipolar twos who've crept into all of our practices. I assume it's no different here than down in LA. And there are now two really provocative studies on the treatment of bipolar II depression with antidepressants that you should know. This is the first one from Jay Amsterdam in Philadelphia at University of Pennsylvania. A, a very original design, amazingly enough, funded by NIH, which was surprising because it's actually a creative design. 81 bipolar twos, all depressed. You give them Prozac openly, okay? You take the responders, this open treatment with Prozac, once they've responded, you then randomize them into a double-blind study of continued Prozac, switch to lithium, switch to placebo, and then you follow them for a year. So it's really a relapse prevention study 
for bipolar twos who've responded acutely to Prozac. And what you find is that the people who stay on Prozac, the red line, did overwhelmingly best. Those who switched to lithium or placebo sweat, um, relapsed back into depression as a, at a much higher rate. So what it's saying is that this, if you're an antidepressant responder, that's probably the drug that's going to not just get you better, but keep you better. And switching to lithium may not be such a good idea. Now what you have is you have a bunch of people, it's not a large N, but you have a bunch of bipolar twos who have been on Prozac for a year. Well, that's an interesting sample. So what's the switch rate in a year? So the last bullet is, if you define hypomania a la DSM-4, because this was published eight years ago, you find there's absolutely no difference in rates of hypomania comparing anti the Prozac people to either lithium or placebo. However, if you actually look at individual young mania rating scale plot points, so this is, uh, this is the Prozac group, this is the lithium group, this is the placebo group, and this is plotting every young media rating scale when you come into the clinic and they do their you know evaluation you don't need to be a statistician look at the prozac group remember we talked about roughening of the course or affective instability it's clear the price of being on prozac and not getting depressed is you have a lot more little ups and downs or a lot of, a lot more little ups um so there's more affective instability if you take fluoxetine for a year but what you gain from that is you're less likely to be depressed. So that's a complex way of thinking because it's not just, oh yes, you know, you take it and you stay better. You stay better, but you also have more affective variability. Okay, second study was a study that we did at UCLA. It was actually a three-center study with my colleague, Lori Altshuler, who sadly died just after she finished this, uh, this paper. Anyway, this was another NIH-funded study comparing lithium versus Zoloft versus the combination of lithium plus Zoloft in bipolar two. So remember, you all, now you have a third of the sample on Zoloft alone. We wanted to do a one-year extension. The NIH wouldn't give us funding for it. So it's a four-month study, 16-week study. And lithium versus Zoloft versus the combo, the efficacy is exactly the same across all three groups. No evidence that the combo confers any advantage over Zoloft. Not surprisingly, the side effects, the highest dropout rate was in the combination, right? The more polypharmacy you're on, the more side effect burden there is. And interestingly, switch rates didn't differ. So 16 weeks of Zoloft versus 16 weeks of lithium versus 16 weeks of lithium plus Zoloft had essentially identical switch rates. So again, showing again that BP2s, we may be able to treat them with antidepressant monotherapy, at least in the short term, in the Amsterdam study showing maybe in the longer term with some significant, um, with some significant safety. And this just shows you the, the switch rate, which I've already described. All right, my last major point, and then I wanna leave time for questions, is this, which is the question of, can you keep it, if you have a bipolar, and we have tons of people like this in our clinic, Bipolar ones or twos, they're on mood stabilizers, you give them an antidepressant, they get better, you try to take the antidepressant away, they get depressed again, what do you do? So I have a fair number of people whose maintenance treatments are mood stabilizers plus antidepressants. Is that safe? Is that kosher? Is this okay? There are now three studies that I show on this slide. One, Lorian Altshuler and I did the 2001 study, the 2003 was a Stanley Foundation study, and Russell Jaffe in Canada did the third. And these are naturalistic studies. None of these are random assignment studies, but in all of them, they found that bipolar patients who had gotten better on antidepressants, you just naturalistically take the ones who are stayed on antidepressants versus those who go off. The ones who stayed on antidepressants had lower rates of new episodes of depression. And in none of the three studies did the people who stayed on the antidepressants had higher rates of switches into mania or hypomania. In fact, in one of the studies, the Stanley study, the 2003 study, those on antidepressants had lower rates of mania. Well, wait a minute. You have a patient on long to bipolar patient on antidepressants and they have lower rates of mania. Why would that be? No one knows the answer. It's always great to read discussion sections where you have to make stuff up to explain why you found what you didn't expect to find. 
But one possible answer is that in bipolar disorder, stability predicts stability. If you're euthymic, which remember these people are less likely to switch into depression, that may confer stability. And if you get depressed again, and the people who went off antidepressants had higher rates of depression, that may make you more vulnerable to then switch into mania. That's the only explanation one can give. And this just shows you the exact data in just graphic form. All right. Uh, these are ones and twos, correct? Yes. So my next to last slide. So the summary, remember I said before, the question shouldn't be do antidepressants work or not work because every meta-analysis gives you a different answer. It should really be for whom are antidepressants effective and for whom might they be trickier or more dangerous. And this is Bob Post, who's one of the deans in our field in the bipolar world. His summary of the data of who is at higher risk to have to switch into, by, into mania if you give them antidepressant. And I absolutely agree with his conclusions. Younger people, BP1s more than BP2s, rapid cyclers, those who have mixed manic features within their depression, you may remember that's a new uh, concept in depression. There's not just mixed mania, which we've had forever, but now there's mixed depression, which is depression with a few manic -y features and people with a history of substance abuse. Remember in the study that we did, oh, history of stimulant abuse was a predictor of switching. So it may be that substance abuse confer, confers on you a longer term risk of a more fragile brain that's easier to knock off base. So that's Post's analysis and I think he's right on. So the summary is, Depression is the dominant, although not the defining pole of bipolar disorder. Among the mood stabilizers, lamotrigine has the best data. Um, certainly antipsychotics, some of them are useful too. That should be on the slide. The efficacy data for antidepressants is weak at best. Remember, some meta-analyses are negative, some are positive. And if I'm going to use an antidepressant, at least from what we know at the moment, SSRIs and bupropion have the lowest switch rate, and there's no evidence that we currently have. There's a myth that bupropion has lower switch rates than SSRIs. There are no data in support of that. Right now, you should consider those around the same and the lowest of what we know. Um, and what you're gonna be careful about is not giving it to people with rapid, with rapid cycling, mixed depressive features, or a history of prior antidepressant-induced mania. The best predictor of the future is always the past. And so again, the question should be who, not if. And with that, let me stop and I'll take some questions. Thank you. Okay, do you have a question? It's very helpful, thank you. Um, I, I heard a, an interview with some of them on a medical podcast a couple of years ago. It really stuck with me about uh, we don't have to worry about switching as much as mood instability, irritability, um, Stuff like that. Yeah. So the data on the roughening of course or the creation of affective instability with antidepressants is as weak as the bipolar depression switch data are, this is even weaker. We have almost no data from modern antidepressants. There are a few elegant NIMH studies that Tom Weir did, um, all with tricyclics. Our colleague Lori Altshuler was on that same unit. She published probably the best paper on this, but all of her data was published in 95 are all tricyclic data. So we actually don't know, and there's no evidence one way or the other for modern antidepressants, SSRIs, SNRIs, Welbutrin, Ramon, et cetera. Do they cause the same affective instability as tricyclics did? The data for tricyclics, I think are moderately impressive that they can do that. We don't have such data for modern agents. Too bad, because we should have it. Yes, sir. So the question is about using the D2, D3 agonist primapaxol or Mirapex. Uh, I've used it only a handful of times. There, is, there are two double-blind studies, both small and placebo-controlled studies, and in both of them, primapaxol, mean dose 1.6 milligrams, clearly worked. So I think, and you may have seen Jan Fawcett, who's again, one of the deans of psychopharmacology, who's now in New Mexico. 
he published this incredibly large case series in the American Journal about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, on primapexil as an, an, as an antidepressant. So that's one that we probably should be playing with more than we are. The fact that you asked the question means you had some interest in it already. Have you tried it? Yeah, and I've only used it a handful of times, so I, I can't tell you I have a feel for it. Peter, did you have a? I've used it a lot, and it's, it's like your data. For some people, it's a home run. For other people, it's a strike three. If you think of roughing and mix as anxiety equivalents, which you didn't mention, for some people, you can get a good amount of anxiety where it's just not there. So the answer, just for those that offsite who might not have heard the question, Dr. Royburn says that he used a, he's used a fair amount of primapaxel. What kind of dose is he using? Usually no more than one to two. So the same range that everyone else is using, and that sometimes it works well, and sometimes it clearly doesn't work well and makes people anxious, correct? Great. There was an, yes, sir? There was a study by Minnesota, a really exciting one, an 18-year-old on mercazepine plus the no vaccine, certainly 80% cure rate, and I've tried it, everybody else has tried it, it sure hasn't been anything like that. What's been your experience? Are you talking about for bipolar or unipolar? No, no, I'm talking about unipolar. Ah, uh, I don't, I mean, I know Star D, one of their, like in stage four, had a mirtazapine add-on arm, and then there was the son or daughter of Star D, where they called the COMED trial, where they used multiple antidepressants for non-treatment resistant depression. But the data showed that the combo for non-treatment resistant people was no better than monotherapy. So I don't remember studies showing that it worked very well, but my experience is like yours. I have not, the, Steve Stahl down in Stan, San Diego has this kind of catch, for, there you go, California rocket fuel, not Washington rocket fuel. And, but that's based on theoretical considerations. He doesn't have any data showing that it's more effective. He just thinks, how many different receptor sites can I hit at once? And so he combines drugs so he can play with multiple receptors. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily better. It just means it's cooler. So, yes, sir. Do you have any sense of the timing to response being different in bipolar depression versus bipolar depression? So the question is, is there any difference in time to efficacy in bipolars versus unipolars? There are no data showing that it is, and I don't think so either. So I, I, I would work on the assumption that the time is the same. Other questions? Yes, sir, again. The data is showing for bipolar 2, block, it wasn't much of a risk. Uh, for bipolar 1, I've got a few people, when they get lit up, boy, they stay lit up for a week, two weeks, two weeks. Do you use fluoxetine with bipolar 1? Okay. So, what's your thoughts on that? So, the question is, do we worry more about fluoxetine because of its endless half-life, right? So, if you want to stop it, if somebody switches and you stop Prozac, it's still going to be about five weeks till the Prozac is washed out. And you're absolutely right. Theoretically, that would make fluoxetine a less wise choice than any of the other SSRIs because all the rest... Paxil is the shortest, but of the others, you know, it's going to take about seven to 10 days to wash out, whereas Prozac is five weeks. So theoretically, you're right. Nobody knows whether that would cause a longer antidepressant-induced mania, but theoretically, it sure as hell might. So that would be a real good reason maybe not to use fluoxetine first. From a theoretical, you know, when we don't have data, even in psychiatry, common sense does make some, gives us some benefit. So... Yes. Do you have any concerns about the cohort movement of the research studies, whether diagnostically, whether the subgroup of people, you know, with, with bipolar to in fact have more of a demand for bipolar? Okay. So the question is, do I have any concerns about the sample of were these people really true bipolar twos? Are you impugning the reputation of our colleagues? <laughs> Not at all. It's a very yeah. tricky well, it's a very tricky business because there are multiple studies in both depression and bipolar disorder showing that the kind of patients, excuse me, the kind of subjects that go into studies are not representative of the kind of patients that we all treat because of all the endless, endless exclusion criteria, substance abuse, comorbid borderline personality disorder, all the endless things that we have in virtually all of our patients. 
So the question for me is not did they, did they have bipolar two disorder? Because I think I trust my colleagues to be honest about that. But are those pa patients really representative of the universe of patients who we see, who we can't say, you know, there are, as you know, in a lot of antidepressant studies, you're not allowed in if you're significantly suicidal. Well, wait a minute. You're going to say to a clinical patient, well, you're depressed and suicidal, and therefore I'm not going to treat you because of one of the symptoms of the disorder for which you're coming for treatment, right? So it, to me, the concern is not misdiagnosis, but generalizability. That's what really worries me. And that's true across the board. That's not just about bipolar studies. Last question, and then we'll stop. Uh, I, I, it feels like in practice these days, a lot of times, uh, we're, we're trying to do something rapidly in an inpatient unit. We start with an atypical antipsychotic, a lot of times we're amputated, they're very agitated. This and is for mania? Or what are we treating? Both, but even, even depression. Anything that ails you? <laughs> yeah. Well, mania or depression, but bipolar. And mm -hmm. uh, it seems like functionally, a lot of times people are just continued on whatever got them out of the acute, and we don't put them separately on a mood stabilizer that's separate. I wonder your thoughts. Well, as somebody who runs, been running a mood clinic for 39 years, I get lots of people from my UCLA inpatient colleagues, 143% of them are on olanzapine. Uh -huh. And because they don't stay in the hospital, you know, the average length of the stay is what, 20 minutes nowadays? The problem is they don't stay long enough to see the weight gain that makes our patients then furious at us, the outpatient docs, that didn't put them on the olanzapine. So I agree with you. Uh, olanzapine is a wonderful drug, but long term, it's got troubles. So but the same as lorazidone, that just continuing on an antipsychotic. Yeah, that one at least is I at least they don't come out hating us instantly because the weight gain with lorazidone, although it's more than placebo, there's one maintenance trial with lorazidone, it's not published yet, but it's there. Uh, it causes a little weight gain, but nothing like olanzapine. But we have time then to transfer them over to lithium or valproate or whatever else, or lamotrigine. But I agree with you. I think, I think there are problems there. We don't have as much integration between inpatient and outpatient docs as we could and should. So, okay. Thank you so much for your attention.